So welcome to this presentation today. This uh, I'm Dell Major. I'll get more to myself in a bit, but just to put this presentation in context, this is part of Mental Health Week throughout Canada that CMHA has been putting on for many years. As far as Indigenous Mental Health goes, that's the name of our program that I'm with as a social worker. And we've put on these, uh, Sandra White, the organizer, has put on a lot of the activities this week. So I just want to thank her in this session as well. Um, and they have another session going on right now as we speak. So, so welcome to the session. So more about me, uh, again, Del Major. I'm a Métis from Regina and the traditional Métis community of La Breth, Saskatchewan. It's uh, about 45 minutes to an hour northeast of Regina. Been in Calgary about 16 years. I'm a married father of two children. Um, I've been a, a helper, I say, for 28 years, but a social worker only really for 11. Uh, the field asks us to get our education and get trained and, and uh, be those formal helpers, right? So since 2006, I've done that. And I've been with this program, Indigenous Mental Health, for nine years next month. But the last two years, less than two years, I've been at a place called The Source. So welcome to my colleagues at the Sor that work at The Source and others here with AHS and other community groups. So this presentation is Métis History, Culture, and the Impacts of Colonization. Our Métis flag is there. That flag is actually over 200 years old in Canada. It's uh, one of Canada's longest, um, I guess, serving flags, so to speak. This Métis definition is the one I, the bum used to. Um, I was, uh, Ray always knew I was a Métis, but didn't know how I was Métis. Uh, I remember one time asking my mom, what are we? And she said we're French and Cree. This was the probably the mid-late 70s where Métis was, wasn't even really used as a term that much. It's used, it was used all throughout the last 150 years or more, but not really in communities. And with the term, with that term Métis, um, it's just been used really since 1982 when the Canadian Constitution uh, was repatriated um, from the Canadian Constitution in 1867. So the term Métis was finally included in a federal document uh, along with First Nations and Inuit as being the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So this photo here is a likely part of a Métis hunting brigade and the, those hunting brigades, one of which uh, that I have I've learned about was near Saskatoon called Round Prairie which is near Dundurn, Saskatchewan. And there's many Métis families that, made, that were part of Métis hunting brigades. It would be up to 2,000 people at times as part of those, as, of those hunting groups. So part of, our, part of our, as a citizen of Métis Nation Alberta and a citizen, um, I guess, by uh, connecting to MNA with Métis National Council, I use these, these uh, uh, their information to guide me on what I, what I say about our community. This is an example of a script, Métis script, this photo. However, I think a lot of them that were offered at Red River Settlement, which is now Winnipeg, uh, was actually a script that could be worth $160 or 160 acres. This one, I'm not sure exactly where it's from. It's uh, from the Glenbow, but I don't know exactly what traditional Métis community might, it might have been attached to. So part of our Métis when we become a citizen or uh, when we join a, a Métis Nation provincial organization is they want proof of how is it that we're Métis. So we can tell them, we can self-identify as a Métis, but they want to know what community we're connected to. So that's, off, that's why I often say I'm from the traditional Métis community of Labrette, Saskatchewan. La Brette is one of the oldest Catholic communities in Western Canada, and it was, it was a, the first community that erected a residential school west of Winnipeg or St. Boniface, which is part of Winnipeg today. A lot of our, we're, we're fortunate as Métis to have all these records back from the 17, uh, early 1800s. Um, 
one thing good about uh, the Catholic Church, it kept records on us, meticulous records on who was baptized, who got married, um, death certificates and so on, as well as the Hudson Bay Company made a record of who their Métis laborers and clerks and guides and trappers were. Uh, they used the term half-breed a lot in, that, in those days. We'll, we'll talk more about that term later. But they talk, we talk about a historic Métis nation in the West here. Uh, I did some research back in 2000 and I think it would be 2011 now, 2012, sorry, where um, I researched from Calgary here all the way to Montreal and back. Uh, I call it research of self from a sense of place. And in that research, I did I ever learn about the Métis Nation, how huge our, our historic homeland is in Canada. And I could, I could see why there was a disconnect with other, other uh, societies or communities or territories or provinces. This is how big this country is because I went, I went in car and took my time and saw the hugest place. So just imagine back then, in the late 1700s, when these communities are forming as Métis, lar large First Nations societies, uh, entire uh, large communities, but with Métis uh, becoming the relatives of the First Nations at the time, uh, it would be amongst the waterways, waterways and the rivers, the lakes where these communities were forming. And, lay, uh, and as those were forming simultaneously, the, the colonization was occurring, however slowly, but not very quickly in the West. Sure, communities were forming in New France in 16, early 1600s, but in the West, when I say the West, I'm talking northern Ontario westward into the Northwest Territories, down into the northern United States was the, the traditional Métis homeland. We have a word that we use in Alberta, probably throughout the West, called Otipim Misawak. It's the people who own themselves. So that's a word like our program. We call our program Indigenous Mental Health in a mainstream way, but we're also known as Igakimat, a Blackfoot word for try hard and find inner strength to persevere. So that's our other name for our program. So the shaded area, the photo there would be like the example of the Beijing Nation homeland. As you see, um, Rob Innes talks about a borderland community, Métis are borderland people. So if you see the U.S. borderland parallel there with Canada, you see a shaded area. There would be Turtle Mountain Reservation, Earlier, uh, uh, a relative of mine was talking about how her dad is from Dunseith, North Dakota. I believe, I believe she said that's the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation. A lot of those people are Métis that got accepted as First Nations or American Indians in the, in the States. As well as a community called Rocky Boy Indian Reservation has a lot of my relatives who got accepted as pre Chippewa people. So they would be in that shaded area south of the border. Um, as you can see, a lot of this stuff is, with geography, it's based on, on uh, the ability to get to these locations based on the rivers and the lakes, because there wasn't roads back then. As we're talking prior to, call, prior to so, the onset of, of um, I want to say severe colonization, can I say that? <laughs> um, there, was, there was only, there were real roads would be, would similar, would be pathways where we're, Horses or, or buffalo would, would, would travel. People would be walking, but there would be also be Red River cart trails where people would know to travel, but mostly it was the rivers and the lakes where people would be. And so this settlement pattern would be because of that. They talk about a Red River Métis uh, uh, connection a lot in the, in the literature, but also if you look at the Hudson Bay and the James Bay, which is lower down in there, that is also sites of Métis ethnogenesis, meaning that's where Métis culture and, and uh, communities uh, developed. So we're, to, we're talking post-contact, which is a term that means, of course, after European uh, arrival in the West. Um, and you got to think a lot just of the West here, of, of, of uh, West Central Canada, Northern Ontario westward would be my, the focus of of this presentation. 
So one person that is, there's a lot, deserves a lot of credit for Métis being accepted into the Constitution is Harry Daniels. He passed away several years ago, and he's, of which the Daniels decision is named after him in 2016. And he is often credited as being a person who, who was able to allow us to be recognized in, within colonization, I guess I can say, right? Um... Now, below all this, I love this map. Uh, it doesn't have Métis in it, I don't believe. But I've seen this uh, photo image and I've used it today. So the Métis were along the Great Lakes there. Uh, uh, they say the original kind of like birthplace of the Métis is not Red River to some. It's actually Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is uh, right in the middle part of the Great Lakes there. Um, I've heard that theory and it's something that resonates with me too. Uh, the fur trade starting in northern in northern Ontario a lot there as well. So Métis culture, ways of being and knowing, essentially what every culture has. We all have ways of being and knowing. Being, for me, is self, family, community, and nation. That's the way I'm being in the world as a Métis. And ways of knowing, There's for me, there's... Um, ways of being in the world, of being Métis in the world that allows me to do how I view the world. Those are, those are my ways of knowing. Um, so culture originates from customs, values, traditions, practices of the Métis. Examples are land. So in Alberta we have the Métis regions. Here it says zones, but they're, they're regions, as well as the Métis settlements. Uh, where there, there used to be 12 of them, but the government took four away, likely due to resource extraction. They decided to take four of them away because too valuable to the grief to have the Métis uh, live there. So they moved them to the other eight settlements or wherever they would go, they would go. Often to the road allowance. So we'll talk about that later. So language is also part of culture. Without a language, is, loss of language is huge when it comes to colonization. When you don't have your language, it's very difficult. Yeah, I believe that you can adapt. You will survive as a culture, even though you lose your primary language because you decide to learn a new one and apply it to what you already know and change the English or French language or whatever it is you're speaking now and then just adapt it to what you know. And you'll and that's how you make people survive because there's not many Michif speakers. Michif is the Métis language. Cree and Soto perhaps Assiniboine or Denny, some of the speakers have that, but they, 99% of the Métis nation will speak either English or French as their primary language. Um, so family and kinship ties. My, I have a person here today, not in the room, but I, I recently I met in my life that's uh, part of the celebration this week who I found out was always my friend in the Métis way. I found out she was my relative. Uh, that's how connected we are. When someone, one of our protocols is we find out where you're from, we try to ask, well, who's your parents? Where are you from? And you try to find out if you're related that way. And you try to set yourself in context with them to see how how you might get along or how you should get along is how we the protocol we follow. So now I know she's my cousin. Storytelling, like today I'm telling you a story of the Métis Nation of history, culture, and impacts of colonization. But this story I tell you, in the protocol way, I tell you how I know it. So I know it because of my mom, Evelyn, told me the stories through my Muslim Tom and my grandma. We called her Baba. It's a Ukrainian word, but we called her, I'll tell you into that story. But my, but my Métis grandmother, they told us stories. We're fortunate with Métis Nation. We have institutions like the Gable Dumont Institute that train us in an academic way to tell stories as well. Um, we have our food. You've had your food today, some of you, um, that we identify with our clothing. We wear a special Métis clothing when it's a special occasion, and sometimes we just wear it just because. Um, shelter, music, art, leadership, decision-making, trade, society, laws, and socialization. I put that note at the bottom there about uh, Paddle Prairie and Elizabeth Métis Settlement, just to honor them, recognize those two communities for allowing us to join in their hockey community the last few years <laughs> at the 
at the so if they're in if they're hopefully there someone's listening in from there that uh, great coaches and players we won the gold we won the silver medal with the paddle prairie team two years ago and the gold medal this year those awesome Métis hockey players so land it's um the, we've, i've talked about territory a lot uh, how i relate to you as a capel valley Métis. i say that because when i when first meet other indigenous people i say that to them it's a way to see if there's other Capella Val Métis around that I can then get to know. Because we don't all know who we are. We don't dispute it. We go by last names, to finding out if who a Métis is. We go by where the people are from. So if I, I, I learned, I, uh, when I was in school at University of Victoria, my instructor, well, one, one of the, actually the Dean of Social Work, uh, let me know that so-and-so must know me because he's from Labrette as well. And it turned out that was my cousin she was with. So it was like cool to know that, right, that that uh, I had a cousin involved in social work and, and helping the Indigenous community in Victoria because of my protocol. I was able to find that out, right? Um, so research of self from a sense of place, that's a, a way of telling people about my research in 2012, part of my thesis, that I was able to go from Calgary to Montreal and back through these communities, Medicine, Regina, Labrette, P.C. Kuen, and I'll mention that. That's a First Nation in near Dauphin, Manitoba. I stopped there to honor uh, the, the late Brian Whitford. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see a documentary called The Gift of Diabetes, it's an awesome... Um, portrayal of his life and how he was challenged by diabetes and how it took his life but in the last several years of his life he tried to respond with his culture his learning his history and changing his 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 ways to try and respond to diabetes and and live a good life the gift of diabetes other communities like winnipeg was then called red river settlement back in the early 1800s Johnstown was a community in New York. Uh, it didn't have any Métis ancestors per se from there, but I had to honor when you when you learn when you explore your Métis history and culture, you're exploring all parts of you, not just uh, one part or the other. You're all parts. One part was um, uh, United Empire loyalists that were part of uh, the United States who left this area, which is now Johnstown, New York. Um, they left come to Canada because they were not part of the, what was going on there with the new the new uh, country of the US so they came to Canada and were part of uh, the the community of Cornwall Ontario so I honor them too by learning about them they were part of the early fur trade they were part of the people who brought the wealth from Europe to create the fur trade in in northern United States and uh, for Canada those companies that we all know who they, most of us know about who they are, the Hudson's Bay Company and the lesser known Northwest Company. And then Montreal and later Sault Ste. Marie. So that's the picture there is me. Oh, I don't know if I'm the horse or the ox, <laughs> but the other guy is uh, my Métis friend helping me pull the Red River card in downtown Calgary. So when you live uh, an Indigenous centered life, a Métis centered life, you decide to do things like this. You pull Red River carts in downtown Calgary. Hopefully there's a police car by helping you with that. <laughs> so, that. That worked out good. That was several years ago. For That was during Métis Week. We have it every year, every November, around November 16th. I'll get into that importance of that date. Shelter, just quickly on this one. This is this memories of the road allowance people. Uh, there, that's a term that uh, I guess I don't know the exact origins of it, but essentially it means those Métis that lived between a road that was built and the farmer's land or some land that was owned by a private individual. Maybe that land was once Métis land at one time, but the point is there's a strip of land each on each side of a road called a road allowance. And... Um, that's where a lot of Métis communities, this sort of rose up because they had to have somewhere to live. So some people, some Métis were, were allowed to live with their relatives and friends with the First Nations. Some lived in the, in the outskirts of towns and 
uh, in the west. One story was uh, there was a Métis community living of all places, the garbage dump near Regina. That's one story I heard from one of my elders that that was hap that had happened in the 1950s. Uh, this this uh, so this is his memory of the Métis laborers that that helped build up the farms in Western Canada. Often those those laborers would be uh, others as well, but uh, they needed a labor force to to uh, to build up agriculture in this country, and often many of them are Métis. Languages that are dying for Métis people, the, the language is Machif, and it's a form of, of um, pre-nouns and French verbs often. Um, with the, uh, those pre-nouns maybe would be Ojibwe or Soto at times, depending on where the community is located. One such uh, mixed community is the Kawasis First Nation and the Crooked Lake Métis community. Now, there's not a, a traditional Métis community there really anymore. Uh, with many towns throughout the West here, they, they're no longer existing. If the people have moved to the cities. We've had this urbanization occurring, right? But uh, there's a book called from Rob Innes called Elder Brother and the Law that talks about these mixed communities of First Nations and Métis that that occurred in the West here. And he talks about how the Cree, Soto, Ojibwe, the Cinnaboyne people, which is Dakota or Sioux, um, lived and traveled together in, uh, in the 1800s. It's, a, it's a, a book that talks about that. Um, family or kinship ties is a, is a huge thing in our history and culture. Um, if we're from the same community, often we can say we're a family anyways because we're, we're asked with our Métis citizenship to do our genealogy and our family trees. Um, it's a way of, with colonization, with the government, um, trying to hold us accountable for our Métis rights. And so we have to provide our citizenship uh, documents to our associations to be in a relationship with the federal government. Um, so one, one way in which we do that is we find historical proof but with my mom, I had to get. Uh, I was getting my citizenship approved, and I had to get a birth ticket to show that where, where my grandparents were. And on there, it said that they were French. So those are that's. That's my baba. She's. Uh, that's a Ukrainian term for grandma. We we intermarried with other cultures, like many cultures do. And uh, my cousin, his dad was a Ukrainian who married my Métis aunt. And then he was learning Ukrainian through that side, and he called her Baba, which is Grandma, and just stuck. So we know her, know, know her as. And then uh, the gentleman on the right was my Mushum Tom, so pre, pre word for grandfather. So it's important to note that uh, they provide me lots of pride and lots of uh, um, honor to have been their grandson. So these, when we talk about colonization, the Metis Nation was an active forced responding to colonization and still still are today but we're off we're an active force in be, in being indigenous centered metis centered in trying to decolonize against the forces of colonization against the impacts of colonization through all kinds of ways and ultimately the ultimate one for any society is um, perhaps an armed conflict uh, responding to colonization so both these individuals here descend from on my grandma's side, Métis soldiers at Batash and at Red River Settlement. And the gentleman on my grandpa there uh, is that we're, we're descendants of the first Métis Nation leader in the West named Cuthbert Graham. And that was a, a battle that occurred in 1816. It was the major battle of Winnipeg probably ever had. Uh, one, of, one of them, there was probably others we don't even know about, conflicts between um, other groups. But this one was a one that uh, was called Battle of Seven Oaks and occurred in 1816. And they, they've honored the community, the losses, and the, 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 I guess the memory of those people in a, in a, in a celebration last year to, to commemorate the 200 years of that event. And so they were, that was their, that was their way of trying reconciling the community. 
I can't tell for certain, but I believe these are residential schools. I just don't know where from, but they remind me of the Labrette Residential School that many of our clients in our program attended, that many have heard of. Uh, likely it's not, but it, it was, it's somewhere. It reminds me of one. So I tell two stories here, the fence story and the reserve story. The fence story was one my mom told me about. I called it that. She didn't call it that. That's my word for it. Where she would be playing in the town of Labrette. She would leave her day running Catholic uh, school, meaning she would just go to school during the day. During break time, she would see other kids playing, maybe after school. And she was getting along and enjoying their company, but there would be this fence between them. And that, and, uh, there's a, there's a documentary about residential schools about Labrette, and one of the guys in there was named Glenn, and I actually had the honor of meeting him, and him telling me that, oh, I remembered your mom. So it was kind of good to hear that oral tradition, not just through these documentaries, but from the, from the relationships that occur in community. And he's now passed on, and so, was he, so, so has she, and they both died of complications due to diabetes. Way too young. She, my mom was 65, and Glenn, I'm, not, was, I'm sure, wasn't much older than that. The other story, the reserve story, is one in which uh, my mom again told me that uh, the Métis work from reserve, she said, but uh, since that time, since her passing in 2006, I've learned that actually, um, and this was from my grandpa as well, that they told a story that we weren't, but in a way we almost kind of were, and some are still, of course, but with our family, we were part of two communities in Saskatchewan that uh, our Métis withdrew from treaty. Now, we weren't, again, remember, we, we wouldn't see ourselves as Métis back then. We'd just, be the, we'd just be people, right? It wasn't a thing to, you know, worry about what your, your, your cultural origins are. We just say that today because of identifying and sharing in relationship with other people who weren't Métis, but they were part of those communities in Saskatchewan, and they would... I believe my theory is the church interfered with all that and the government, state and church together decided through colonization that you, Métis, that, that knows English and French, you're not going to be part of this church at Labrette. Because of your language skills, we need you there, we need you this, in this town. That You're not going to be a part of this. So they were either encouraged to leave, I don't know, if I, I, I don't have no proof that they were forced to leave, but they withdrew from the treaty, they weren't part of it. And they probably didn't even know there was a treaty coming. But the, the forces of colonization through church and state probably knew. Thus why Métis often weren't part of reserves. So one of the main foods with the Métis is uh, pemmican. Now, I had to laugh the other day. Someone said it's the ultimate power bar. It's actually like buffalo, berries, and grease mixed together, and it lasts up to two to three years apparently if it if preserved properly. And then with the onset of colonization with flour and sugar, they were then allowed to make Western foods like bannock. Bannock actually comes from the Scottish people. And the Métis were the ones that uh, would, would make it a lot with the First Nations. Okay. So one, one recipe in our family was Le Boulet and La Bang. I don't know if there's any French speakers in the room. But that means bullets and bangs. Meatball, hamburger meatball soup, and then la bang was because of the dough. The story there, my mom told me, was the dough would make sounds cooking in the oil and a, like a popping sound. And that's what they call it, la bang. Clothing, there's me there at Métis Week. That jacket would be too warm to wear today. Um, so Métis Week's around November 16th because of Lou Real Day. It always lands in and around there. And then we'll get into Lurial in a bit. But the Métis flag, I made a mention there that uh, because of things like Métis Week and the hard work of people like Marlene Lands and Joe Pimlot and Lawrence Gervais with our Métis Nation leadership in Calgary, we now have the Métis flag flying at Mount Royal University. So those are places I like to be at when I see the Métis flag flying. It flies in front of Regina City Hall. It flies at Edmonton City Hall, and I'm sure it must be flying in Winnipeg's downtown somewhere. If it soon to be flying, if it's not, those important things uh, when it comes to colonization and responses to colonization, I believe, because people need to need, need to see symbols that 
they still matter, there's still value in what how they live and what they believe in. Arch is another one. Gable Dumont Institute has been a huge part of of my life from Saskatchewan. I was I completed my a lot of my education through them. Named after Gabriel Dumont, who was the Metis General uh, as part of the 1869-70 and 1885 Metis resistances. Some people in the history books call them um, revolutions. But in a Metis-centered way, we call them resistances because we're responding to the forces of colonization. Okay. At that time, Canada uh, uh, purchased the land from the Hudson's Bay Company never consulted the indigenous peoples about that, that transfer. So you didn't, there wasn't the buy-in, there wasn't the recognition of land and, and uh, relationships that existed already in the West for over 100 years with the Métis and then thousands, millennial for the First Nations. So there, I'll just quick, that's the more about leadership there. That's a, that's a York boat, part of the uh, fur trade era, and a Red River cartwheel, part of the Red River carts that were part of the hunting brigades in the west here. For those that don't know, that's the, throughout these slides have been the Métis sash on the on the right hand side. There's all kinds of Métis sashes that can be made or have been made that are different colors. They've been influenced by the European sashes that have that have infiltrated different or what's the word for it? Influences the different societies. You'll see them throughout the world. But uh, these, uh, there's different Métis sashes that represent different communities, different regions of the country. So three terms that are important to mention is the, is, is a pre-contact would be the time period in which it was, this was just Turtle Island before contact with Europeans. Contact being, of course, the, 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 the period in around the 1500s where you got settlements. Recently, I, I, I thought I knew a lot about Canadian history, so I learned that there was Portuguese communities in the, in the East Coast at one time that didn't stay long but left. Vikings and so on, but the ones that stayed were the people of New France and then later British North America. So with contact, and then now post-contact, you have a emergence of a Métis nation. But that has gone on for over 200 years in parts of Canada as early as the 1750s. You have evidence of, of Métis communities forming in the West. Uh, and there's there's discussions in Canada about other mixed Aboriginal communities uh, that are, uh, have occurred prior to that as well. Post-contact, free control is a key term for Métis culture because that that is how cases like Daniels in 2016, cases like the Manitoba Native Federation versus Canada in 2011, I believe, Though that's a term that they've that the courts have decided that uh, important for Métis uh, rights to occur out of that post-contact pre-control part of of the development of the Canadian society. And in Alberta here, there's we we had our Métis hunting rights um, cases a few years ago that were denied us because um, in southern Alberta, at least speaking for southern Alberta, they said that. We didn't have a Métis community here. Evidence of one at the time of this post-contact pre-control period, which they say is about 1870, and I've seen another source say 1874. So we we don't have that, but there's Métis hunting rights in different parts of Canada, like the west, and mostly in the northern parts of the province. Only in one treaty is there real mention of Métis. That's in Treaty 3, Northern Ontario. The other number treaties, one to eleven, uh, some some uh, Métis were may have been invited in by their relatives or their their allies to be part of those treaties in those communities, and I believe even some of the communities in southern Alberta, there's there's the people who are who are part of a Métis community that were entered into these southern Alberta First Nations. Actually, Gabriel Dumont's uh, either wife or his mother, one of his the women in his family is from is Dene. And the word or the reading I read was just from Sutena. That case I talked about was the first corn case that for Alberta, Alberta Métis hunting rates. 
So this is a picture of my third great grandfather, Cuthbert Grant. He's, he's recognized as a, his dad was one of the wealthy Scotsmen that helped start the Northwest Company. So these are very um, important persons in the fur trade. And then Métis were the, uh, along with the First Nations, were the labor force for this fur trade. With the onset of the Industrial Revolution, though, that they, they lost their standing in society and with colonization, they, they were forced to the margins away. Uh, and these, these captains of industry took over with the building of the railroad, the roads, and the other businesses that come in and pushed them into the, to the road allowances. Picture of Louis Riel there. there there's, there's discussions about, about uh, even some major groups that wish he gets pardoned. I'm not one of the people that want that to occur. Because to me, pardoned of Lou Riel would mean that um, he essentially he's awarded the state that he was within the apparatus of Canadian society, did something wrong, and now needs to be pardoned when in fact he was the leader of the Métis Nation and was hung in Canadian law for treason against the government. So I don't think when you're part of a nation and another foreign power wants to pardon you, it doesn't really make sense. This is some of the leaders we have in Alberta here. One of them was Harry Daniels, who was in Alberta here. We have uh, our national leader. We have other leaders since 1928 in Alberta here that form Métis Nation of Alberta. So there's Métis Nation in a figurative sense of, of a people with, with all these uh, ideas of culture, but then we have our organizations that we join and we so we can organize ourselves and practice our culture, and that's called Métis Nation of Alberta. So in, the, in Saskatchewan, we had the Métis farms. Here in Alberta, they have the Métis uh, settlements. But we had the Métis farms in Saskatchewan, one of which was at Labret, where my family's from near Regina. And there was many Métis colonies or farms, but they no longer exist today. It was the government's way in the 19, 1940s to try and get Métis involved in a new way of life of agriculture and other other industries. Uh, but it was a failed experiment. It was a social experiment that failed through colonization. Impacts of, uh, other impacts are the social determinants of health. So in Alberta, th there's research that's come out that with our education and employment um, have led to uh, increased incomes for Métis community. Um, that's a big part of uh, what the government tries to do with Métis Nation is make investments into that. And it's a key one for us. A lot of the times, like when you look through with the fur trade and the buffalo hunt era, okay, from the late 1700s until uh, around the turn of the 20th century, was a time of entrepreneurship with, with those kinds of uh, occupations and sense of entrepreneurship. So it makes sense that, that those kinds of things would be effective for Métis education, training, and employment. Lou Riel and Gabriel Dumont in that picture, m and emblem. Impact of colonization is trauma, essentially. I, don't, I, uh, I, I leave this at the end, probably not enough time to really go into it, but essentially the, la uh, the lady that was talking earlier in the session from the Sutina First Nation, she said it best. Um, it, Often it takes powers in society, uh, Supreme Court justices uh, like uh, McLaughlin, um, the head of the TRC, Justice Sinclair, who happens to be First Nations, okay? But people in powerful positions that say a story and then people say, oh, okay, oh, it must be true because they're saying it. But when the people that are affected by the colonization, by the trauma, say it, not sure if they're talking out of health or they talk it out of sickness or unhealthy behavior, right? So when it, that's good that people are realizing that the, there's, there's truth to these stories. I don't really call it culture or gen genocide. I prefer the term Canada's war on indigenous peoples. So the, the bullets aren't flying anymore. The, ex the explosions aren't occurring. The wars aren't occurring that way. But they come in different forms. They come in the form of policies, decisions, behaviors that either isolate, um, expose, uh, put people at risk, make people unsafe. So the Indian Act and all that, don't know what they're going to do with it, but 
The, for instance, with regards to government policy, the, the province of Manitoba exists because of the Métis. Briel and other Métis leaders with the Manitoba Act helped develop that. So I use the term, I like using the term that I learned from my professor, Dr. Kathy Richardson, about how the Métis were both colonizer and colonized because we were in this crossroads through wealth and through political persuasion to be both the colonizer, but because of our lack of wealth and influence, we were also the colonized. So we have this uh, this this uh, dual kind of experience with Canada. But the hope that some of our leaders that would become equal partners in confederation, there's these new agreements that have come up. But really, I've, in my worldview, I've seen these uh, uh, people I work with that are Métis, they're in dead end, dead end wage earning jobs, not having the opportunities that they need. And then I've known other people in my own family who are more privileged. So the gambit is runs the whole course from people who have passed on to their issues uh, that have really gotten nowhere in their life to people who have been really successful. One, one success story for Alberta here that people don't know a lot about, but I'd like to tell people about that our, uh, the Lougheed family uh, extends from a Métis family as well. And there's a book coming out on it from a Dr. Uh, McKinnon. So we're gonna, I'm just going to give some time you now for questions. Really the road ahead is hopefully a, hope, like a better one because um, it's been a long time now of these negotiations and that has been under like 150 to 200 years of this, it, this relationship between Métis and Canada that these agreements and these kinds of forms like this, education and training that we're allowed to to have these kinds of um, opportunities to learn more about each other. For instance, I didn't know, like, for instance, uh, one of the greatest Canadians of all time, Terry Fox, was actually a Métis. Imagine as a young kid in the early 80s when I was a teenager, I knew he was a Métis. I can identify with someone who was doing something good for himself, his community, and for Canada. Only now, decades later, do we know that now. So he was honored in BC for his accomplishments as a Métis person. So we'll open up for questions. I know there's only a little bit more time left, but is there any questions in the room and then we can have a bit of a discussion about history, culture. This one here is a picture with Michael Ferlin, a Métis from Manitoba. One of the Flames' uh, great players that has arised with my son and me. That's my son when he was a baby. Uh, and my late mother, my brother, one of my best uh, colleagues there. So questions and discussion. History, culture, the impacts of colonization. The colonization will, will it, it won't end. If you look through societies, it, it's occurred throughout centuries. It's been that way forever. But what doesn't and won't end for for communities like ours is decolonization or Métis centeredness because we've been going at this for a long time too. This two-story thing of narrative practice, the two stories, right? Decolonization, decolonization, the two stories. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between First Nations and the Métis? Okay. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. So the question was for the sites, First Nations and Métis relationships. Really, it's uh, the, the, the origins of Métis are really with certain First Nations because of geographical patterns going east to west. The Cree, the Soto, the Ojibwe, the Assiniboine intermarrying there. And then not with so much the other First Nations, really because communities that survived colonization through hundreds of years were able to survive in those relationships as opposed to other ones. So the relationship is a real good one today in lots of ways. In other ways, it's, it's um, a challenged one because of colonization. Colonization um, allows, doesn't allow for this sameness. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it all depends, I guess, on you as a, if you were a, as a Métis person uh, from a family a community, like, I decide that relationship. The people I intermingle with decide on the relationship. So I, I myself have good relations with First Nations. So it's really a, 
a community specific thing on how we do that today. Yeah, so it's not so formal actually. Um, it's for, uh, it can be formal though. For instance, uh, there might be some ceremonies that occur that would formalize those First Nation Métis relationships. And I have to apologize to the other sites because I don't know how to get questions from the sites. Does someone jump in and tell me there's a question from another site? I don't know. But I hope I was able to answer your question. And I'll be around after for other questions as well that you might want to ask off camera. Um, could the discussion anybody? Um, a point you want to make? Sure. Okay. Sutherland, he's a sitting councillor. He's actually Métis. Yes, he is. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Word Sutherland, there's not, there's, he's from the Southern Manitoba. He, he's, he's been at, uh, he's been involved with our Métis Nation community here in Calgary. So awesome to have in, him involved in our city council here in Calgary. Between Métis and all other people? Yeah. Just amongst people? Because I know a lot of times when people have this exception. Yeah. This is, there's not a lot of facts. Yeah. Most of the time. Um, but maybe they're too afraid to engage with a Métis person or a person. Mm. Like what kind of events or how would you? Well, like one good example is everyone is allowed to go to our cultural activities. Sometimes they don't, they feel they need an invite, but Maybe some of them are invite only, but for instance, I can't speak for First Nations, but I know I'm invited to a powwow. I know I'm allowed to go to a powwow. It's open, open invitation. I get uh, sweat lodges too. Like you, you just gotta know. You gotta get, enter into a relationship. You yourself, as an individual, have to be okay with entering into a relationship and learning about these activities and how you can be a part of them. That be just be respectful. Be be transparent, be honest with what you want to know and who, you, how, what, how it is you want to know. Give the explanation of what you want to know and how it is you want to know what you want to know kind of thing, if you can follow me. <laughs> Give some background to what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, right? And if you do that, then that should be a good start of relationship that allows you then to work through fears, any type of discomfort you might have, and work it through. Yeah, so this topic is the end one, the impacts of colonization, it's a hard one. But it, to me, I, back in my, my research 2012, um, I accepted it. I accepted the, about the impacts of colonization. I, 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 I took on the cause of, of Métis centeredness and decolonization. Because I seen there was a history of it for hundreds of years anyway. I just, really, I kind of knew it, but I didn't know it. So that's why it's, for me, it's, it's a difficult topic a personal topic, but a, a topic that I'm able to talk about because of entering into relationships with communities, with relatives and allies throughout uh, my life, right? That spans my research or my relationships span since I was a teen, right? I've been, I've been gifted with going to schools like Gabriel Ron Institute, like University of Victoria. These are indigenous specific education and training programs that allow me that also relationships from community as well, right? I don't have my parents anymore, but I have my, my cousins, I have my allies in Métis, and just need to allow me to speak in these ways. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions. I'm sorry I was unable to get questions from anyone who might be at another site, but I know there's some tickets here. Do they mean something, these tickets, Deb? Yeah, I'm sure okay, so we want to come get the draw done and we'll wrap up. Um, what else can I say? If you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, like steps ahead for yourself as an individual, uh, I'll give out my email if you have want to contact me. It's um, del.major at ahs.ca. I don't have it on my slides, but D-E-L dot M-A-J-O-R-E, so like major but with the E on the end, at ahs.ca. So I guess... Uh, yeah, I guess I'll do the. I don't. I don't want to draw my okay, own. Okay. Okay. We'll just take my if ticket. you pick it. <laughs> so.
285729 under the B825279. So thank you to AHS and to Indigenous Mental Health, uh, our program, as well as the CMHA for having CMHA for having this event. And I hope I was able to impart some knowledge and motivate you to learn more.